welcome to episode seven of the New England Holstein podcast. This podcast is a sponsored product of the New England Holstein Association. The New England Holstein Association is a nonprofit membership organization in existence since 1921, which is dedicated to encouraging the breeding and raising of registered Holstein. I'm your host, Betsy Bullard. I farm with my family here at Breguin Farms in Turner, Maine. And I also have the honor and pleasure of serving as the Area One Director for Holstein USA. This podcast series aims to provide resources for our members at the New England Holstein Association and the larger dairy community while increasing member connectedness. You can find our previous episodes and more information at nesholsteins.com. Today's guest is Nick Randall. And Nick, I have to admit, I had to refer to the, the tagline on your email to understand or at least to be able to quote what your job title is. And it says U.S. Marketing Lead dairy productivity and milk quality. And, and I think our new, certainly our New England members and, and our dairy folks around the Northeast see you as a familiar face at lots of dairy activities. You're a resident of Massachusetts. You're a tireless promoter of the red and white Holsteins and still serving as president of that association. And we always look forward to seeing you at our various activities around New England when we think of partners for both our Holstein, larger Holstein Association and our New England Holstein Association, certainly the work that Zoetis does, and you can elaborate on that a bit with the Enlight, Enlight product and, and system. What folks always love to hear is what's your Holstein intersections and experiences that have led to you or have contributed perhaps a bit to where you are at this point in life. Don't forget your homework assignment, though. At some point in the podcast, we need to talk about an iconic Holstein cow, both perhaps in your experience and, and a New England cow as well. Appreciate the opportunity to be on here today. I am the, the marketing lead for dairy productivity and, and milk quality at Zoetis, which means I uh, am responsible for our products in the reproductive dairy genetics and milk quality space for the United States. So such products, right, as Spectrum Ass, Lutalyse, Clarified Plus, just for example. i uh, been in this role now for six years and been with Zoetis for 11. Honestly, my, my first company right out of college, I started working with and have, have been here ever since. And it's been a, a great experience uh, so far. I moved to Massachusetts in 2019. I moved for love at the end of the day, married my, my wife, Ashley, who many of you probably know uh, as a, a native Massachusetts resident. And maybe had pretty good Guernsey here in, in the last few years. I think, I think pretty good's a safe, yeah. a safe description. Yeah. Well, I'll absolutely talk about a, an iconic New England Holstein <laughs> uh, in my mind, but uh, from, from my perspective, right, it's a little, a little hard for me to say anything else, but pistachio pie for New England overall as a dairy animal. I think that's a very okay sort of <laughs> inclusion. I, I think she could, could we even call her like an an honorary Holstein or something like that? I mean, I feel like a cow you know, of that stature, um, really. I, I think I think that'd be fine as long as there's no connotation to believe that there's any Holstein within uh, Pistachio's <laughs> line, uh, which has been confirmed multiple times through genetic testing. It's It's been a great experience here so far in Massachusetts. I've, I've definitely been open, welcomed with open arms. I've, I've appreciated getting to know lots of people, especially you, Betsy, and, and um, interacting with the youth around here. I grew up in Indiana. And I grew up on a dairy farm there, Holsteins, that we had up until 98. And that's when we sold out. But I kept a few heifers back myself and have kind of built from that and still have red and white Holsteins today. My dad and I really appreciate the ability of having that as a way to like get together, definitely no matter what situations are happening throughout the year um, at, at different shows. And, and we've had a lot of success there and appreciated the, the Holstein breed from that perspective. I went to, to college at Cornell University. That was obviously a new experience for me being in New York, right? Long distance from home. I, and I had no problem with it, but it was, it was definitely different. It's shaped who I am today, in my opinion. I, I think the experience that I've had across the whole United States, whether it's been obviously from my roots, going to college, starting out in South Dakota with Zoetis, and then eventually going back to New York, now Massachusetts, I've kind of had a, a wide range and my job allows me to obviously have different uh, experiences from traveling across the U.S. and abroad. It's one of those things I just appreciate being able to connect with producers all over. Everybody does it differently, but honestly, at the end of the day, everybody's going after, in my mind, kind of the same goal, right? Trying to find profit, trying to find ways to keep the farm alive and, and thriving. 
And I think it's really cool to see how people do that in, in very different ways. Well, thanks for sharing that kind of framing for folks to understand where you came from and kind of what your role is today. And when we think of familiar faces that we see around activities in New England, certainly those youth, youth activities are, are things that both you and Ashley have been involved in and so very supportive of. And we, in previous podcast episodes, have, have touched on the fact that we're not that any of us here in New England are biased, but we're pretty proud of our youth programs and those connections that are made and, and really are helpful to our young people. Being able to see different parts of the country in, in terms of how developed their youth programs are. New England, by far to me, is, is at the top. I've got to experience all the different aspects of what New England dairy truly drives on with these kids. I don't see many other places, to be honest, right? Like I didn't even see it in my home state growing up. I was part of 4-H. That taught me a lot. At the same time, I wouldn't have said that we had as many programs as what you guys have out here. The drive that kids want to be a part of those programs. I think that's what's so fascinating to me. You know, especially obviously, you know, my mother-in-law being an extension for a long time that, you know, recently has retired. Her dedication to, to youth is is something I think it's is outstanding. And, and I think that that's something that we probably don't talk enough about from a Red and white dairy cattle perspective, it's something we're focused on as a board every day. We're trying to find ways that get more youth involved because if we don't do that now, that's what drives organizations, right, to be end up becoming non-existent. Uh, I'd say the same is true for, for the Holstein Foundation. I'm on the board of trustees for that. Obviously, YDLI is a, a huge component of that. I'm very proud to be a graduate of, of Class 10. That's something as well that you kind of look at and say, how do we keep getting people or keep them involved even beyond that junior level. And I, and I think that's probably our biggest gap overall from a dairy perspective is getting beyond that 21 years of age, unless you're going back to a farm, there aren't many things that really keep people fully excited to stay involved with, within our industry. I would say I'm definitely an anomaly for my age group in terms of still being very involved in, in breed associations. Yes, I, I own cattle, but I, I don't have a farm anymore. Right? But I still find ways and, and want to be involved, and it's it's something that I think uh, we have to keep really focusing towards the main task as an industry. Tell me more about Holstein Foundation and Young Dairy Leaders Institute. I know we've had several guests on who are graduates of the program, and I know you just mentioned it, and and hopefully our listeners in that group of listeners, there are some young people that this could be a great opportunity to continue their development and to continue how they're connecting and connected and able to keep moving our, our dairy business forward. Holstein Foundation is obviously a, an adjacent part to the Holstein Association overall. It's whether we're talking about YDLI or the different competitions that exist within the, the Holstein Convention space that you know, teams from New England and all over are competing to make sure that they understand about the industry as a whole. And, and it makes it a, a fun way, right, to, to stay involved and, and learn different things. My experience within YDLI, I would say still today, I look back, I, I don't know if there's another leadership opportunity out there for that, that young professional that is better. There's components to it around being on a board. There's components to it around promotion of dairy, there are components around leadership in general, and honestly, just self-reflection. And I think the camaraderie that is built there and, and a lot of the, the long-term friendships that you establish, all different sectors uh, of business that still filter within dairy in some way, shape, or form are long-lasting. From my perspective with it, the foundation continues to find those different ways to keep people engaged. And honestly, even looking outside of dairy to see who are other people that are within agriculture that want to look for some kind of leadership opportunity and engage in a, in a cross-species conversation or, or, you know, even think about people maybe in plant science and, and, and embrace them. And I think that those are the things that really help us moving forward with the next generation to make sure that agriculture continues to grow. From my perspective, I, I think that you look at what the Holstein Foundation is is doing. It's it's something that's not being matched by a lot of different organizations, and, and we need to have more of that type of interaction. If one of our listeners was interested in learning more about the Holstein Foundation or Young Dairy Leaders Institute, the best resource for them would be simply to go to holsteinfoundation.com and check it out. 
shoot me an email. If any trustee members are, are definitely willing to have conversations. I would say that last year, as the, the next class was getting put together for YDLI, I probably had anywhere from eight to 10 different people that reached out wanting to know, was it worth their time? My answer always is yes. Like it's, it's definitely worth your time. But yeah, there's lots of information that's available on the website, but feel free to reach out to anyone that's on the board or even any of the alumni, right, that are, are from past classes. Everybody is always willing to give their opinion and, on just how influential it was and, and how they can help you, you know, become the next, uh, next member of a class. I would join Nick in encouraging our listeners to pursue some of those opportunities. It's a great way to do those activities that we don't always force ourselves to do, those reflective activities and in a setting where there are pretty amazing connections to be made as well, which keeps life a little bit more interesting. One of the places that folks see you as a familiar face is at our Holstein conventions when we talk about Zoetis being a partner with Holstein USA and, and how the end light process works and what sort of information that means for our members as our members continue to keep making a more fantastic Holstein cow and and working on making sure that their dairies are profitable and that they have great information. Can you tell us a little bit more about that for folks that maybe haven't taken advantage of some of the resources that are available through that or aren't really 100% sure what the process looks like? So for the last 10 years, we've been in partnership at, at Zoetis with uh, the Holstein Association. And, and it really started, as you said, Betsy, with the, the InLight program and trying to find that way to co-mingle genetic information in an easy to use platform that also provided analytics and helped producers see where their herd was going. As we continue to evolve that partnership beyond, you know, just the, the InLight platform, we've had a lot of interactions from a, an R&D perspective when you look at uh, genetic advancement, uh, genetic conditions, and, and overall just trying to make sure that the Holstein cow continues to be as prolific as she has over the last, uh, you know, 20, 25 years as we've, we've tried to you know, change some things from either reproduction, health, and longevity. We did move to a, a more evolved, I guess you could call it, platform of, of InLight here in the last couple years and took it back into the Zoetis, I guess, ecosystem from, from the Holstein side, just because we had a, a current platform search point that allowed us to make changes in a much easier fashion. And so we evolved in, InLight into a, what we call a little bit more user-friendly, gives you the ability to have also a mobile app, desktop and mobile at the same time, and really looks at... Overall, how do you want to manage your genetics moving forward and, and gives you some benchmarking tools as well? I would say our partnership with, with Holstein USA has been one of the, the best ones that we have had in, in the history of our company. John Meyer and, and, and Lindsay Warden have been fantastic to work with over the years, as well as all the other staff uh, that we collaborate with on, honestly, a weekly basis to make sure everyone has their genomic results delivered in a, in a timely fashion. I would say as well that, you know, as you look Towards the future, we're always trying to find ways to make that Holstein cow more bulletproof. And that's what we've really been driving on with a lot of the, the wellness traits that we developed back in 2016, you know, looking at, at mastitis, lameness, calf respiratory disease, and those big things that really cause an animal to not fully express their genetics and leave a herd early. And we've been able to show that has been driving that progress that we want and provides that cow that honestly, at the end of the day, is, is best for all of our herds. What I think is really cool, though, about our partnership is that it's not always just focused on, you know, a certain index, right? We, we provide every index back along with our own to all of our Holstein customers and, you know, the other, you know, 70, 80 some traits that, that come with it and allows you to really freely make whatever type of cow you want. We are focused, obviously, on an ideal Holstein cow that has been set by the association, but the reality of it is you can make your herd what you want it to be. And I think that genomics are something that now are truly being seen in that light. To me, that's that's really exciting. You know, it's it's another tool in your toolbox to be more confident in the decisions you make every day. No one says that you have to use a specific index continuously the way that it's built out. If it's not fitting the specific type of animal you want to create, you've got lots of other traits you can put together. The biggest thing that we always push on is make sure you're focusing on those things that truly drive an animal to be the most profitable and honestly invisible within your herd. 
you know, it's kind of funny to say those things, but if you have a, a Holstein or um, any breed, honestly, at the end of the day, that you never know she really exists until you look at her her record sheet, that's probably the most ideal cow you can have in your herd. And Betsy, I don't know if you would think differently, but to me, that's that's kind of how I look at it. I would agree 100%, Nick. I mean, I think when you when we talk to other other members, and it's always fascinating to, as you said, see how different farms approach breeding strategies and and think of what that ideal cow is for their farm. And I think those cows that don't require a lot of extra attention, unless it's head scratches and, you know, the that's occasional right. bath. Exactly. Love, that's yeah. Exactly. So that's a tremendous set of resources for, for our breeders to, to utilize. And as they keep working on that goal, it's amazing strides that have been made over as you said, the last 10, 15, 20, I mean, when you think about our organization, has been in place since 1921, just in New England. So there have been a core group of people that's been really interested in how are we improving that Holstein cow and how are we interacting with one, you know, the benefits of membership and connectedness and shared resources and improving those resources is pretty amazing to see over time. How about that iconic cow? And I think it's really hard to follow pistachio pie with that kind of yeah. knocks it out of the park as far yeah. as one named cow that continues to have tremendous impact actually in her breed, which is outstanding. Yes. We actually took a few of our animals to get flushed today. And we took one of uh, our friends as well that has a, has a Guernsey. And I was just actually messaging my dad. I said, so what does he want to use on her? And he goes, American pie. And I was like, oh, shocker. <laughs> <laughs> I think that when you think about pistachio and legacy that she is obviously left on the, the breed, it's it's huge. And, you know, not taking anything away from iconic Holstein cows around the globe. It's it's really cool to have something that's honestly right so close to home. You know, her pictures live within our house in multiple places. So <laughs> I, I, I run into pie a lot during the day. But when I, I guess when I think about, you know, from my perspective in, in my my short time there's a cow that I got to personally get to know. You'll, you'll at least hopefully like this one, Betsy. When Ashley started out, she actually worked for the Maine Department of Agriculture and lived at Pineland Farm. I got to know uh, Pineland Golden Hemi pretty well uh, in my, my visits. And I will say that she is a cow that over those few years of watching her develop, it was just really cool to, to see. Her getting a 95 status was awesome. I know all the work that went into it, for that, you know, getting to experience those things. So for me, she's kind of the whole thing that comes to mind right away uh, for me in New England. And uh, she kind of holds that, uh, that spot uh, in my heart. I think that's a great example, Nick. And I love that your story of Hemi and your experience as to how you intersected with her story is mirrored with a lot of our other guests talking about their iconic Holsteins. They're iconic not just because they were 95 or because they were recognized at a big show. And many of them also have that, but there are very personal stories that go along with and are part of that connectedness and are really a pretty big added benefit. Clearly, it's not just the black and white ones that are uh, that are doing this job. We do like the red and whites as well. <laughs> I know it is kind of funny, right, that I, I highlighted the black and white one. For, for me, I, I, Hemi just kind of hits that spot. And like I said, just kind of getting to watch her over a few lactations continue to improve. And uh, when she hit 95 status, that was pretty awesome. From a, a red and white perspective, I think that's the other thing, too, that you look at the evolution of, of our breed over the last five to 10 years. What a change. You can talk about from the show aspect to begin with and, and look at how big the red and white shows have become. Uh, last year, right, we was the second largest class at World Dairy Expo, right behind the Swiss Hunters. That was astonishing to watch. All those red and white Holsteins marching through the ring. As you look across the country, too, and start seeing, even in a an all-Holstein show, the amount of reds that are coming out on top, not just in class, but also becoming intermediate champion, grand champion, it's a true testament of what we've been able to do. From the red and white perspective, you know, even on the production side, I, I look at it, too, and, and think about the number of animals we're starting to see hit that top 
production list, you know, whether they're red and white or they're red carrier. I think that that's also a, a, a huge improvement and change than, you know, what we saw in years past. It wasn't that long ago, right? Our red and white Holstein was kind of seen as a negative thing. It was a, a genetic condition that we didn't want. And now it's something that you're, you're kind of looking for, honestly. I think that that's just what's really cool as far as dairy is concerned and how we can, we can evolve. And honestly, I, I do think that genomics had a part of that. Great to see how breeders take all the information that's out there mm -hmm. and keep making a cow that outpaces, I think, anybody's wildest dreams 25 or 30 years ago, what our Holstein cow can do today. And, and I remember family members talking about in their lifetimes that a red calf, so you just make sure to get that out back behind mm -hmm. the barn so nobody knew that really good cow of yours might have a calf that was different in that way or quite quite the other extreme that we're excited to have those and that interesting work going on with our breeders. So Nick, I think you're probably aware of some of our upcoming calendar of event activities. We are close to the beginning of the Big E Eastern States Expo Fair. I would assume that folks might see you there off and on again. And those dates are September 12th is the Heifer Show for the Northeast Fall National Show. We'll have red and whites that day as well. And Friday, September 13th, we'll have milk animals showing both black and white and red and white and looking forward to seeing some fantastic animals from all over the Northeast. It doesn't seem like it's two, not even three short weeks after that, that World Dairy Expo kicks off in Madison, Wisconsin, but that is the time of year where shows are in full swing and we'll uh, enjoy having folks check out those results on our New England Holstein website and Facebook page as well and check out what breeders and exhibitors around the region are up to. Other upcoming events, October 19th and 20th here in Auburn, Maine is our New England Holstein Convention, and we certainly extend a warm welcome to members and non-members and friends of members and anybody who's looking to enjoy some fantastic scenery here in Auburn, Maine, and some outstanding conversation as well, and an opportunity to catch up with other friends and neighbors and neighbors from really far away or not so far away. As a Mainer, I think we're pretty aware that Maine is not really on the way to anywhere else, so. It's great to have an event that's actually being hosted here in Maine and, and give folks an excuse to come on up and check out some great cows and great scenery and, and a fun set of events for our juniors to get them all excited for National Convention in St. Louis next year as well. But Maine is vacation land, so absolutely thinking about making that trip. It's always a destination because, like I said, it's not really on the way to anywhere else. It has to be a destination. <laughs> So as a reminder, this episode seven podcast is sponsored by the New England Holstein Association. Find our podcasts on Spotify, YouTube, nesholsteins.com. We look forward to offering advertising opportunities and upcoming podcast episodes. So stay tuned for those. Nick, thanks for joining me today and uh, telling us a little bit more about your experience and your current role and the partnership with Zoetis, all those different information points with Enlight and genomic information and the amazing process that our breeders are doing, making a fantastic cow even better every day. No, thank you for the time. And obviously appreciate the, uh, the ability to go on here and talk a little bit about not just myself, but obviously what I kind of see around the country. And like I said, it's been a great experience living in New England and we truly enjoy our home here in Massachusetts and look forward to visiting with everyone, and whether it's one of the shows you mentioned or obviously at, at conventions and, and other youth events. Again, thanks for having me on. I have to uh, do this again.